what works and what will save these patients' life is transporting them because you have a high index of suspicion for a sentinel bleed. And that's it. Uh, once these things open up, they almost always die. Welcome to EMS Cast. Matt, it's been a few months since we started this thing. How do you think things have been going? I think things are going great. I'm having fun. Uh, I just wish we could do more. Yeah, it's been a ton of fun doing this. Actually, that was one of the feedback I got from one of the medics on the street is he he asked if we could do something every week, and I really wish we could. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we're both very busy right Not now, yet, but guys. we do have one big update for you guys, which is the website. Uh, we've recently finished the build on a website and Matt, you want to tell our listeners where they can find that? Yeah. Shout out first off to Tyler Prince for coming on board and helping us out. Another former paramedic helping us out with the website. So the website is emspodcast.com and it has show notes, links, pictures, figures, an embedded podcast player. Um, nothing too fancy, but hopefully we'll continue to make it grow and, uh, make it more interactive and, supplement what is on the audio part of the podcast. Yeah. Everything about the podcast is on there. We'll link, uh, studies that we talk about. We'll link research studies that we talk about here. There'll be the, like you said, embedded audio player. There'll be a part for feedback where you can actually put in comments that will go to us. Our bios are on there. Our emails are on there. Again, you can find that at emspodcast.com. Yeah, today's topic uh, is going to be one of those topics where you'll want to go look at some of the pictures that we put in the show notes just to make it all make sense. Um, so this is a great time to check out our website. Yeah, we are limited somewhat by the audio format and some of these things you really just got to look at. And so if you go check out the website, you'll see some pictures that'll help supplement your learning here. So Matt, what are we going to talk about this month? Today, we're going to talk about the tracheostomy and the bleeding trach. And what the hell you do when that happens? Yeah, trachs are something I feel like when you walk into a room and you see you have a trach patient, you suddenly realize you know very little and these give you a lot of anxiety. It's not something that I thought about a lot in the ambulance, but man, when these go sideways, it can be a true emergency. So I think this is a super important topic. Uh, what do you think is so important about it? Well, I think this is the A of ABC's airway. So the, the tracheostomy tube is an airway um, and loss of that or obstruction of that or a problem with that is a problem with A, which is the first thing we worry about. I got essentially no training on this in paramedic school, and I honestly really haven't gotten much formal training on it since becoming an ED doctor either. I really just had to bug a bunch of respiratory therapists and ICU doctors to figure these things out. And airway problems are terrifying. Without an approach to solve them, uh, you're just going to be either on the street or in the back of an ambulance crap in your pants. But when you have an approach, you are able to just fall back on that calmly and, and proceed forward. It's like we've always heard and, and we've kind of quoted before, we do not rise to the occasion. We fall to the level of our training. And with trachs, we unfortunately have to train ourselves. So hopefully this episode will get you up to speed and, and get you confident with this. And my objective for this episode is to give everyone an algorithm and an approach for the Trach patient and the bleeding tracheostomy. All right, so let's just start out with the discussion of what is a tracheostomy or for short, trach. Yeah, it's a hole in the neck. Uh, the patient, uh, for many reasons, will get a hole in their their neck into the trachea, and that is now their airway, and they breathe through that hole instead of through their mouth or their nose. This is a lot different than a cricothyrotomy in the sense because we do the crike um, in the space between the thyroid cartilage and the first cricoid ring, because that's a, a bigger, easier area to access in an emergency. But when something's going to live in the neck permanently, they do it a little more inferior, closer to the sternal notch into the trachea itself. So it's called the tracheostomy rather than, um, a cricothyrotomy. The tracheostomy is the hole in the neck into the trachea, and the tracheostomy tube is the uh, special modified tube that goes into that hole that the patient will either breathe from, uh, a mechanical ventilator will be hooked up to, 
Uh, um, or in some cases, you'll bag that tube. The term trach is used interchangeably to informally describe both the hole and the tube. And uh, in some cases, both at the same time or one or the other. And throughout this episode, we will most likely just use the word trach. Why do people end up with these? I think the, the most common reason someone gets a trach is they will require prolonged mechanical or assisted ventilation. So this is your person that a paramedic intubates in the field. They get admitted to the ICU. Day five, six, or seven, they're still intubated and there's no sign of them coming off the vent. So it's safer and better for them overall from an infectious standpoint, a, ventil- a ventilator physics and mechanics standpoint, and a host of other reasons to have a tracheostomy tube placed uh, lower down and and start the process of moving them out of the ICU and getting to a long-term care facility. And, and so that'll be the most common reason someone has a tracheostomy. Some other reasons include cancer or masses that are in the oropharynx or in other words, superior to the trachea or the vocal cords that obstruct breathing from above. So you put the tracheostomy in below and, and then now they have a patent airway. These patients don't necessarily need the mechanical ventilation aspect of the trach. They just need it the patent airway aspect of the trach. Of course, there will always be other reasons that you'll see trach patients in your career, but I think the above two, the obstruction and ventilation principles are, are the, the two most common and what most of us will see, if not only see throughout our career. Yeah, I think the idea of a tracheostomy often seems like a morbid or uh, gruesome procedure and thing to have, but when you think about the alternative to just having an endotracheal tube through your oral pharynx, if you need that for an extended period of time, whether it's obstruction or muscle weakness, a trach honestly is much better. You can get up with a trach. You can move around with a trach. You can, there are cuff trachs. There are different things to allow you to speak through a trach. You don't have to be sedated. You don't have to be sedated. It's much more comfortable. You can eat uh, if that's still a possibility. And so there's a lot of advantages to having a trach. Can we talk a little bit about the equipment? First and foremost, there will be a picture in the show notes, um, but you feel free to Google, find your own picture of it. So I'm going to talk about it while I'm looking at the picture that we're going to use in the show notes. Trach tubes are the same idea as an endotracheal tube uh, that we use to intubate people. They're modified, they're shorter, but all the concepts are the same. And so if you remember that, then I think that can help you minimize the freak out factor. They are just a lot shorter of a distance. Uh, In other words, they're stubbier so that they go from just where the skin of the neck is to into the trachea and a couple centimeters uh, above the carina. So they're much shorter than than our classic endotracheal tube. Looking at an actual tracheostomy tube, they all have um, uh, a place that it's secured to the neck uh, and those can look different. But again, don't don't worry too much about that. What you want to pay attention to is Um, That trachs can have what's called an inner and an outer cannula, and that's what you're sort of used to seeing on an ET tube. In other words, there's uh, two hollow tubes. One is the outer cannula, uh, and then there's an inner cannula that goes, that's another tube that you insert into the outer cannula. The vast majority of the trachs that you'll run into, the, the people will have both an outer cannula and an inner cannula. In other words, like a two tube overlying system. In pediatrics, there's often just a single outer cannula. The inner cannula inserts into the outer cannula and is removable. That's the whole reason that they do this dual system because you can take that inner cannula out, clean it off, um, replace it with a new fresh one, uh, suction it and and wash it and and then put it back in. And and that just is, is much more hygienic than having a single system. The outer cannula is the thing that stays in all the time, keeps the hole open. It has the balloon at the end of it. Um, It is, it is there for the duration of that actual piece of uh, tracheostomy equipment's lifetime. It is changed way less frequently than the inner cannula. You can change and clean or exchange an inner cannula essentially as much as you want. The outer cannula is left in place much, much, much more longer. There's a plastic ring on the outside of the the cannula, and that usually tells you the size and and the type of trach the patient has. So when we take an ET tube out of the packaging, it'll we know to look on the, at the very top of the tubing that there's the number like seven O, is on there. This is no different. The numbering and and the type of is just on the piece of plastic that's on the outside rather than on the actual tube itself. 
while the inner cannula is removed, the patient can still breathe through the outer cannula. So if you're ever called to a call and, and the inner cannula is out and, and they're breathing through that, it is totally fine to just let them breathe through the outer cannula, get them to the hospital and let them get a new inner cannula placed. Some trach tubes are cuffed, um, and if they are cuffed, they'll have a pilot balloon for inflation, just like our standard endotracheal tube. On the actual pilot balloon itself, just like our endotracheal tubes, it'll have a number in mLs on there, and that's how much the balloon should be inflated. Trachs also have what's called an obturator. You probably will very unlikely see this on scene or in your career as an EMT or paramedic. The obturator is serves the same purpose as the stylet does in our endotracheal tubes. It's mainly put in there to give it a stiff, rigid, um, kind of curved form for when we put the entire trach in into the into the uh, tracheostomy hole in the neck. So the obturator is often thrown out or, or not present on people who've had a trach in for a while. But it's worth knowing about if it is on scene and your medical control physician tells you to try and replace the trach, you, can, you are more than welcome to put the obturator in just for a little more rigidity to kind of pass it into the hole. All right, so we're going to get into some nitty and gritty details here about a really good, straightforward, algorithmic approach to this. But when the shit hits the fan, I need things to be simple. Do you have kind of a, if nothing else, remember this? Yeah, if you are freaking out and you can't remember that annoying dude from Denver and what he said about tracheostomies, this is our WTF approach. WTF approach. Suction the trach or the trach hole if the tube is fallen out. Uh, but either way, suction whatever's there. And then if the tube is still in place, connect the BVM to the trach tube and start bagging. If the tracheostomy tube has completely fallen out, get a pediatric BVM mask, uh, seal it around the hole and bag the hole just like you would as if that were their mouth. Once you're bagging the patient, get them on the pulse oximeter and call medical control. That's all you have to remember. Once you're on the phone with medical control, if they ask you what your question is for them, just say, should I replace this trach, intubate from above, or put a 6.0 ET tube in the hole. So I'm going to do that one more time. Suction the trach or the trach hole. If the tube is in place, bag them. If the tube has fallen out, put a pediatric BVM mask on your BVM and bag the hole in their neck. Once you're bagging, put them on the pulse ox, call medical control, and ask if you should replace the trach, intubate from above, or put a 6.0 ET tube in the hole and bag that. All right, let's go ahead and get into some of those details now. What are the complications of tracheostomies we're looking for in the field? Complications are often broken up into uh, less than three weeks and greater than three weeks. And this has to do with the typical healing time of the tracheostomy hole itself. So in the less than three week zone, the common complications are tube dislodgement or obstruction, infection, bleeding, and pneumothorax. Remember, we are doing a procedure at the base of the neck. And right near the base of the neck, as you'll remember from our penetrating neck wounds episode, is the lung and the thorax. So pneumothorax is one of the complications they can have. Very rare, though, What you'll most likely see is tube dislodgement because the person is just not used to living with a, a tube in their lower part of their neck. In the three weeks and beyond complication zone, we start to see things like tracheal stenosis. So the inside of the trachea is getting thinner from having the procedure done or tracheal malacia. So it's... Uh, the trachea is kind of whittling away and granulation tissue is forming. You'll still see the tube dislodgement and obstruction. You can have equipment failure. So that's, you know, kind of falls in the dislodgement and obstruction, but it also falls in the inner cannula falling out, it not being sized appropriately, a balloon popping, things like that. And then you get into this super scary, super rare but butt-clenching scenarios of the tracheo-anominate fistula. So this is when the, a connection forms between the trachea, the airway, and essentially the aortic arch. So you have the big pipe that air goes through and the big pipe that blood goes through, and now there's a bridge between them, and that's bad. That's just, you're just bleeding into your airway and into your lungs. The other one is the tracheoesophageal fistula. So you can imagine that this is uh, also bad. This is the windpipe forming a bridge to the esophagus, the food pipe, and then you're getting uh, regurgitation and aspiration of food contents into the, the trachea. And then finally, infection like pneumonia and aspiration in general. So there's one specific uh, situation we didn't quite 
touch on in detail of why somebody might end up with a tracheostomy. I think you talked about cancer and a mass in the neck, but this may lead to a surgical procedure known as a laryngectomy, where they actually go in and remove that mass, but with it, a good portion of your upper airway. Now, this is going to be important to us as paramedics in the field. So you'll get a person who has cancer and they have a trach for that reason, and they'll have the tube and the hole in their neck. You can also get a patient who has had this laryngectomy procedure, which I still really don't understand how the hell they pull this off, but they'll have a hole in their neck and they won't have a tube through it. And that's okay. That's supposed to happen. They just have the hole in their neck and they breathe through the stoma, the hole in their neck. But if you think back to our WTF approach, it will not fail us here because we will be bagging this patient with a BVM mask over that hole and that will take care of the ventilation part of their problem and you won't be able to mess up their laryngectomy. The reason this is important is because these patients cannot, cannot, cannot be orally intubated. All right, Matt, let's go through a scenario. So you're called to a scene for an unknown medical problem and you arrive to find a patient with a tracheostomy. What's your approach to this patient? So my approach, I'm going to simplify it into the A, B, C, what, when, why. So airway, breathing, circulation, and then I'm going to ask, what kind of trach is this? When was it first placed and how old is it? And why did they need this trach in the first place? Great. So we start this out like we do most all of our calls, A, B, Cs. Can you break down the airway assessment for us? Airway. Airway. The reason they called 911 is because this is an airway problem. So you're starting with A, and this means that the problem is with the trach or the airway or the path to the airway itself. So if the patient is on a vent, like if you're called to a house and they have a mechanical ventilator at home or you're called to a facility um, that's not a like a general hospital and they're on a mechanical ventilator, the first step is to disconnect them, hook them up to a BVM with 100% oxygen and see how they do. If the problem seems like it's obstruction, you're going to do that first step of suctioning the tracheostomy itself, the trach hole. And if you're at a facility or even a caregiver's home, you can ask if they have suction tubing that fits the trach, that it's totally reasonable to hook up to your suction system and give that a shot. Once you do that, place them in high flow O2 or bag the patient. If the patient is still difficult to bag after you suc suction them or there's a frank obstruction, at this point, you're going to call medical control and discuss intubating from above, which is our classic orotracheal intubation, or passing a 6-0 ET tube through the tracheostomy versus just BVM them as best as you can while you rapidly transport them to the closest hospital. The why and the when here are incredibly important. The doc that you talk to on the phone will need to know when the trach was placed in order to help you get out of this very tricky situation. A new trach or a trach that's less than seven days old is extremely high risk and passing anything into that hole is almost never indicated in the emergency room, let alone in the field. On the opposite, if the patient has had the trach because they have a giant epiglottic mass, intubating from above is just not even an option. So the, the when and the why here are incredibly important. One of the other things you'll get called for is what's called decannulation. In other words, the trach fell out. So this is just another A problem, right? The, the tube that was in the airway is not in the airway anymore, and now it's just a hole in the skin and the trachea. You can always follow the WTF approach. So you put high flow O2 or a BVM over the skin hole, seal it with a, a pediatric mass, um, and, and ventilate them that way while you're calling medical control for advice on whether to attempt replacing the original trach device, intubating from above, or passing a, a fresh ET tube into the tracheostomy. Again, knowing the, the what, when, why here are so important because medical control's advice to you will be based on the answers to those questions. So that's it for the airway part of the ABC what, when, why approach. Now we'll move on to the breathing part. Breathing. So the airway's patent, they don't need to be suctioned, the tube is in place, but there's some other issue going on. So these patients are very, very susceptible to both pneumonias and then skin infections around the trach site itself. So these can cause breathing type problems. And as long as you are able to ventilate easily or bag them easily and get them on 100% oxygen, this is 
this is all that is needed to be done and then transport them to the hospital where we can figure out what to do next from a breathing standpoint. Next is C for circulation. Circulation. The main thing you're going to see here is bleeding. And, and for the vast majority of us, we're going to be really lucky and we're going to see just a small amount of bleeding and oozing around the trach. These patients should always be transported um, and you just follow the same approach. Try to bag them, ventilate them easily, or put them on uh, oxygen via mask over their trach hole. Call the ED, give them a heads up that their airway and breathing are okay, but there's oozing around the site and it's no big deal. Now, what is a big deal, which is essentially a gunshot wound to the neck, is massive bleeding. This is one where you're going to load and go, call the receiving facility immediately, and start two large bore IVs while you're doing your best to bag and oxygenate and ventilate the patient. Now, what we're going to talk about next, Ross, is a pretty advanced maneuver for when you have a massively bleeding tracheostomy. And I think it's important to give a disclaimer that this is not routine practice. This is what we do in the emergency department and is probably reasonable for a paramedic to try once they've done all the other stuff we've talked about. So you have two large bore IVs, you're already bagging them, and you've already started driving lights and sirens to the closest emergency room. Yeah, I think you've highlighted this, but it is worth repeating. A tracheo-innominate fistula is a catastrophic emergency. These people will bleed out quickly into their airway, meaning they're not only losing their circulation, but they're also losing their airway. Oftentimes, these will be preceded by what's called a sentinel bleed. In other words, they had a small, minimal bleeding event that seemed to stop on its own. This occurs right before they let loose. So that minimal bleeding you talked about before, it's it's most commonly just an irritation ulcer from either that balloon or right at the skin site with the trach. Most commonly, that minimal bleeding is minor and will resolve on its own. But that's why we're transporting all of them. Exactly. Because when it's not just that, when it is a sentinel bleed before the tracheoanominate fistula, this is a life-threatening emergency. Let's say you're in the back of the ambulance. You have a, someone who's bleeding a lot um, through their trach or around their trach or somewhere in their neck and you, and you're... Uh, you have your two large bore IVs, you're bagging as best you can, uh, but and, but they're becoming hypotensive, they're in shock, and, and you just feel like you need to do extra. There are two maneuvers that you can do that, that we will try in the emergency room. The first one is you overinflate the tracheostomy balloon. Check out the show notes for a picture of how and why this is thought to maybe work. It often doesn't work, and the patient often just dies, but Essentially, you take a syringe and you blow up the balloon past that number that's on the pilot balloon and hope that that overinflation of the balloon either provides partial or complete tamponade of the bleeding vessel or the bleeding fistula itself. If that doesn't work um, or you're, you're not getting enough hemostasis with that, the next step is you put your finger into the hole of their neck in kind of a hooked fashion with your the tip of your finger pointing down at their heart. And you try to compress the fistula or the bleeding vessel against the clavicle or the rib or whatever stiff bony prominence you can find and, and press against that vessel and cause tamponade that way. Again, this often does not work. What works and what will save these patients' life is transporting them because you have a high index of suspicion for a sentinel bleed. And that's it. Uh, once these things open up, they almost always die. All right, let's move on from that scary topic and move on to another scary topic, pediatrics. Any differences with the pediatric tracheostomy? No, not really. It's the same approach. One minor difference that you may see in a kid every now and then is that they may only have the outer cannula on purpose, and, and that's fine. But other than that, it's the same approach. What I would say is that these parents of these kids or the caregivers of these kids are, like, way smarter than even the pediatricians or the pulmonologists that take care of them. They're just so invested and they know so much about this that you have to ask them what they think is going on, where where they want the patient transported, what they've already done to troubleshoot, why they couldn't handle this at home. Because most of the time they can handle this at home far better than any of us could in the emergency room. So if they're calling 
it's it's good to just straight up ask them, be like, what have you tried so far and why did you think you needed us? And they'll tell you usually exactly why they need you and exactly what to do next. I would say one of the other really, really important ways you can be helpful here is ask them what hospital they want to go to and do your best within your protocols and your uh, procedures to, to transport them to that hospital because that's what's going to be best for that kid. If the parents seem overwhelmed or they don't have a lot of information or they're new to this, then all the things we talked about above with adults apply to kids and there's nothing that you have to know differently when, when handling kids. What I will say is do not let your ego get in the way of asking the parents what you should do. Summary. Matt, this has been a great breakdown of tracheostomies and their common complications and our approach to them. I'm going to go ahead and just summarize it for our listeners. You get called to a patient with a tracheostomy. You're going to follow your ABCs like you do with every other call. You're going to start with the airway. You're going to suction the tracheostomy to relieve any mucus plug or other obstruction that might be there. You're going to assure that there's a tube in place or an oxygen delivery device in place. Second, you're going to move on to your breathing. If they're not breathing adequately, you're going to bag them. If you need to disconnect them from whatever vent they're on, disconnect them from the vent and make sure that you're manually bagging them or just BVM with a pediatric face mask over that tracheostomy hole. Next, you're going to move on to C. Make sure that there's no bleeding from the tracheostomy site and make sure that there's no concern for an imminent tracheoanominate fistula. You're not going to forget to ask what, when, and why. So what type of trach do they have? Is it cuffed or not cuffed? Do they have an outer inner cannula and those other anatomy things we talked about? When did they have the trach placed? If it was placed within the last seven days, you're not going to attempt to intubate through that tracheostomy. You're going to have to tube from above or bag them with a pediatric face mask. And then why? Why did they have that tracheostomy placed? If it was for an obstruction above, then again, you're not going to be able to intubate from above. You're going to need to deal with what you have with the tracheostomy site. And always don't forget to call for help if you need it. Medical control is there and happy to talk you through any problem you might be seeing or troubleshoot or just to bounce ideas off of. All right, Matt, to finish this episode, do you have any take-home points you'd like our paramedics to go home with? I do. Take-home point number one, if the trach tube fell out and the caregiver didn't or couldn't replace it, call for help to discuss intubating from above, replacing the trach tube itself, or placing a 6-0 standard endotracheal tube into the hole. It is also totally reasonable to just bag the hole with a pediatric mask and transport like that. Take home point number two. Once you listen to this podcast and review the equipment of a tracheostomy tube, the rest is everything you already knew. You know what hemorrhagic shock is and how to deal with it. You know what sepsis is and how to deal with it. You know what airway obstruction is. You know how to fix hypoxia. You know how to fix ventilatory failure, and now you know how to troubleshoot this very, very specific type of airway obstruction and cause for hypoxia or ventilatory failure. You're going to be scared when you see these patients. It's going to be nerve-wracking, but remember that WTF approach. Suction, bag, and call for help. The final take-home point is for the bleeding tracheostomy. Massive hemorrhage related to a trach is rare and almost always fatal. The most important thing you can do is load and go. We talk about some advanced maneuvers like overinflating the balloon and putting a finger in the hole, but this is only after you have loaded the patient and left the scene and established two big IVs and tried bagging and oxygenating the way we talked about. That was a great episode. Uh, Again, don't forget to go check out the website for pictures and links. That's emspodcast.com. Our emails are on there. There's a comment box. Let us know what you guys think about the show and, and what topics you want us to cover in the future. 